Welcome to The Journey. I'm Julianne Hartman, and I have a very special guest with me, Elizabeth Hirschberger, and she is one amazing woman. And um, she's been sharing her story about the life that she lived as in an Amish cult, <laughs> an Amish, you know, lifestyle. And um, it's been pretty intense. So you need to go back and watch the last two. If you're just coming on today, you haven't heard anything. We really need to set it up for you so that you know where we're going from here. Um, and it's probably one of the most emotional journeys I've ever done. But I just love the fact that she is speaking from her heart. She's telling the truth. And because, you know, it's the truth that sets us free. It's the truth of the word of God that sets us, us free. It's the truth, the word of God that set you free. We know that we're getting to that. Um, mm -hmm. But also it's the truth of knowing that, you know, these things are real. They are real that even though they live a lifestyle of, let's say the 1800s, but it is in 2023. And so you may not be an Amish person. You might be something else in another kind of an organization like this. Um, so I believe this is going to help you too in every way in your life. And so thank you so much, Elizabeth, for coming on and sharing your personal life with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me back. This is amazing. And um I do want to echo what Julianne said. Don't come in and start watching on the third episode. Like start from the beginning and please watch until the end because there is a redemption story here. It's not just one of pain. There is uh, a redemption story. It's really a miracle, honestly. So watch from the beginning to the end. You're going to be blessed. It's going to be emotional, like she said. But if you watch to the end, I can promise you, you're going to be blessed and encouraged. Yes. All right. So we left off with the fact that um, your dad was unfortunately was molesting you from a very young age until you were 18. And the way that he did it was that it was um, helping you become more of a woman and uh, how you had shared that if you were, you know, when you saw he would explain to you that if you saw women, girls that were more well endowed, that that meant that they liked what they were, the treatment they were getting from their fathers, and it was making them grow and become more of a woman, which is really sick and twisted. And so um, just that alone, when, you know, I, I don't want to jump too far ahead, because what I want to ask you is like, what did you think? What did you think when you found out the truth of like, what? This was not, this is not God. He doesn't do this. That's, so that's about the next step that we're getting. Okay. Into. So are we, are we getting there? Because I also yeah. want to ask you about your husband. So was he also in the same sect of Amish? The hurt, what was the name of the Amish? Words and Trooper. Words and Trooper. Right. Was he, he part was, of that too? He was. Um, I want to clarify one thing. Cause I, I referenced other girls. Now their dad was not doing that to them. Right. So I just want to clarify that, that not every Amish father thinks this way. This was just what my father was using right. um, as a, as a method. Of to, course, to, to convince you that this is. Like yes. And so I want to make absolutely certain that this is, people understand that this is not every Amish father. This was my father. Right. And listen, I mean, there's Christian fathers, right. That are doing that kind of thing as well. Oh, yeah. Like, oh, yeah. It Whatever is. was happening when we when we talked about this on the that episode where we discussed this was I asked her what was going on in your house, yes. not someone else's, but you know these people that have a have a sick mind. And your dad obviously had mental illness, and yes. so for someone to convince a young girl that this is something that is supposed to be done, the part that I think made made me cry like I did in that one is you trusted him. You know, it's like we as kids, we only have a mom and a dad or maybe just a dad or maybe just a mom, but they're here for us to trust and yeah. we're going to hang on every word. And, you know, even our daughters, my, our daughters have trusted us from the beginning in their, in their late or late twenties and middle twenties, and they still trust us. And so that trust is so important. And then we, you know, we trust something like this, but then we go, we say to God, well, I don't trust you, God. Like what? How and can I, we even for a second? I know the show is not about my thoughts right now. So I oh, go ahead. I, I love it. Um, and I think it, it, it actually helps people. What you just said is so amazingly true. And it, I think it also helps people 
maybe understand why, because I've been asked so many times, how could you believe that? Like after you were a teenager, you still believe them. Well, I never heard differently. So why would I, I've heard that when you abuse a child, they won't, they won't stop loving you. They will always come back and they will love you. They will stop trusting you, but they won't stop tr uh, loving you. Um, you asked about my husband and what happened when I found out that it wasn't true. Um, so like I said, when I turned 18, the abuse stopped. Um, and I met my husband when I was, well, actually I first met him when I was 15. Um, but then I hadn't seen him again until I was 19, I believe. And we started dating and then we got married at when I was 20 and I never told him any of this because I didn't know to. Um, so on my wedding day, I'm praying that we don't have girls because I don't want my husband, you know, to, oh. do, to have to do this to his girls. Ironically, my first two children were girls and I love it. And I love having my daughters are a huge blessing. So praise God that he just didn't listen to my prayers. <laughs> I was so misguided. Um, he winks at our ignorance, right? <laughs> yeah. And so um, I met my husband when I was, I believe I was 19. And then we got married a year late, a year and a half later. Um, and I never told him. And when I was pregnant, a two, okay. So let me back up a little bit. Two weeks after I was married, my sister and I, we, my sister and I married brothers. We were spending the night at our in-laws, um, brother-in-law's house. And our husbands had gone to their parents' house. And so we, we shared a room. Are you still Amish? Yes. At this point, we're still Amish. Okay. And I don't know why we got to talking about stuff like that, but we did. And she told me that that wasn't supposed to happen. And I got really angry with her. I was like, what do you mean? And so we got kind of into it and I was like, and how would you know this wasn't supposed to happen? And she's like, uh, Bill, like her husband. Anyway, so she finally convinced me and I was laying in bed and I'm just like rolling back and forth. Like, I was just like, what? Like I believed. And so at that point, a part of me just died. Like the best I can explain what I turned into from that point on was um, a blob. Mm. Like if you can imagine making bread, but you don't put any yeast in it, it's just not going to be worth anything. Like it's just not going to do anything. And if you're going to try to bake it, you're going to come out with a rock. That's what I felt happen. Like that's the best way when I think back of what I've from that moment until Jesus, I was a blob. I was, I was mentally just gone somewhere. I was, and I think, I think our bodies can only handle so much. And then it shuts down. Like it protects us from too much pain basically. Um, and so I feel like that's what happened. But when I became, when I was uh, two weeks from having my baby, my first baby, and my sister-in-law, who was also at the time my best friend, um, had just had a baby. And so it was a, a Sunday. So our church Sundays were every other Sunday. So we only went to church every, every other Sunday. And so this happened to be a Sunday where um, everybody went to church, except my husband stayed home with me. Um, and my best friend had just had a baby and so she didn't go to church she came over and stayed with me as well for some reason that I do not know I opened up to her what happened and my poor husband friend of your husband yes oh. he had not yet known anything about any of what had happened to me and so I don't know why I thought it was a good idea to tell her in front of my husband before I had ever told him. Oh gosh. And she, her response just shocked me. Like she, she, her response was like yours. And I thought, well, that's weird. Like I'm just giving her my life. Like this was my life. Like why is she responding quite this dramatically? Um, 
And so my husband, he's sitting at his desk. He's actually writing a letter to his parents because that's how we communicate it, living far away from our parents. You know, we write letters. Didn't call. Yeah, yeah you can't you can't make a phone call. And so I remember he just grabbed his stationery and he went upstairs. After he had heard enough, he just went upstairs and I did thought he, did he comment during it? Did he say anything to you or no. just with his eyes as big as golf balls I mean he had his back turned oh. he, he was sitting at his desk and, and and my friend and I are sitting behind him and all of a sudden he just picks his stuff up and goes upstairs now he's he's the kind of guy where he doesn't really react um his responses are very pre um meditated like he'll think about before he responds and but this, I think he had just no idea what to do with it. Like, I don't think he, I, I just don't think he had any idea what to do with it. Now, I interpret it as, I I read his actions as, oh my gosh, what did I marry? Like, wow, how do I take this person back? Um, And so I started making comments to him as, you know, we never really directly talked about it very much at the beginning. Um, but I would make comments to him like, I'm so sorry you bought a wife from the Goodwill. And he would be like, please don't say stuff like that. And I thought, oh, okay, you don't want to talk about it. And so I was totally misreading him. He was just hurting for, for me. And he did, he had no idea how to talk about it. He had no idea what to say. He was just dumbfounded. But in the meantime, in, in that from the time I was 18 until like 21, my dad had gotten himself into some weird crackhead kind of religion where he believed in reincarnation and we go through this life again and again and again until we've learned our lesson. Uh, hell is not a thing. The Bible was called the black book of, the, of lies and it was, he believed in spaceships, like we're suddenly going to be picked up by spaceships. So not only have I had this pain of, you know, all my growing up years, religion and, and abuse, and now I'm confused. Like he really plastered that new belief uh, in me. And I never really felt peace to believe about it. But anyway, that's another story. I, I just became really spiritually confused. Um. And so, and I'll never forget, this is how much fear I was living in. I was, after we were married, we had kind of a sun porch and I was standing out there and I saw a, a plane come, you know, in the sky with their headlights on. And I almost passed out. I was like, what is that? And my husband's like, um, that's a plane, like a jet or an airplane, whatever. And I was so relieved and he just couldn't figure out. Now, my thought was, is that a spaceship? Am I going to miss it? Am I going to miss my right to heaven? Like it was unbelievable. But he, some of my brothers had believed with him, not all of them, but some. And um, so they actually ended up leaving the Amish because of that kind of religion that he was in. And so they, that weekend that they left was the weekend that I just told you about that my best friend was at my house. I told her everything that happened. She went home and told her husband, who is my brother, he had no idea. And she thought he was going to go kill my dad. Um, but he went and talked to his brothers that were following my dad. And so um, when they found out what had happened, they were like, well, you know, we can't follow this monster. Like we're coming back. And then that's when my mom found out what happened. And we thought she was going to have a heart attack um, because it was really hard on her. Uh, I can't even imagine because the three, three girls, right? There's four total. Four total. The four daughters were yeah. all sexually abused their whole life. I mean, you know, their whole child life. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> also around the time then when uh it was leaked to the law to the the local authorities uh what he did and then he ended up going to prison for eight years so 
oh my god oh, oh my god this story just keeps going so oh, he did god. he did he did go to prison for it um and we still don't know exactly who some amish person who knew about it leaked it to the authorities um and so he did he did spend some time in prison for it um two different times actually and so yeah it was a it was a rough time for our family because sending sending somebody to prison was not not a thing that you hear about very often in the Amish and it was a very not only shameful thing but it was just a hard thing for us to go through as a family um in the Amish community now at this point when he went to jail we still had no knowledge of Jesus we had no it was just all pain and so the thing that was being taught to us was don't talk when the investigators come out first of all and second you gotta forgive you know and so we're going to jail and visiting dad we're going to prison and visiting dad until obviously after we then left we were educated on the idea that we don't have to so um, now, was he remorseful at all when you would go visit him well it was really hard to know whether it was truly remorseful or not because of I mean to me I didn't know what to believe um is he now I I think so but I don't I really don't know him and I don't I don't really want to I in order for me to heal I had to I really just had to go to the Lord and say he's not my dad um I don't want anything to do with him this side of heaven um and you are his judge, his, etern his eternal judge. I don't really care uh, if I spend eternity in heaven with him. Sure. But this side of heaven, I don't want to because I really, I'm getting way ahead of myself. But part of my healing journey was I had to cut that um, connection to him off in order for me to heal and right. move past what happened. And so that's what I did. And I, so I really don't know him at this point. I really don't know my dad right now. Um, he is living with my mom. And I mean, as far as what I'm hearing, he definitely seems like he has changed. Um, but personally, I don't know him. Wow. All right. So um, I know we did jump a little bit. He did jump ahead. <laughs> yeah. So when did, like, how did you have conversations with your husband about, did he want to even talk about it did he want to kill your dad did he like want to make it all go away for you like how what was his response so his response was actually really different he he definitely was mad at my dad and I asked him once I was like didn't you just want to kill him and he's like well maybe but he said that wouldn't have helped you I think he kind of focused his his the way he kind of dealt with the pain and and coping with what he had just hurt was try to help me heal and for a long time I interpret it as oh it doesn't matter to you like you're not even mad at my dad like you know yeah. so there's that little misunderstanding there um but he really just focused him his whole self into um just helping me heal helping me cope and he was the most is the most patient husband I have ever met. I mean, he's just, he was very sensitive to my needs at the time. And just, he, he just really was there for me. Um, and we did go to counseling um, a good bit, but it never helped. And and again, I don't know, I maybe this is where we need to go right now. I don't know. Um, it's kind of, there are some other factors, but it's pretty much you've you got what happened to me and and uh i feel kind of like we're just going into the healing journey right now um i went to counseling and and you know you get a lot of knowledge in counseling but for me i wasn't getting healing i wasn't it wasn't working i was still leaving frustrated i was still i mean yeah there's a lot of knowledge that i tried to apply but none of it healed let me um, ask you a question. Did you feel like they they were almost encouraging you to indulge in your emotions about it? And that's why healing couldn't come forth? I I don't I don't think so. I think it was more a scripted 
kind of thing. Like, like, okay. So when you say indulge in your emotions, they kind of had this thing where like, did it make you feel this way or this way? And then you had to go and kind of write all your, what you were feeling out and then deal with each individual one. And it was just, to me, it was just too scripted, but I do want to back up a little bit and just give a little, uh, um, idea of when we left the Amish because when oh, my you know what you're right we did get a little bit yeah, of that. We that, have that, to go back to that. that is actually an important part right. um, so I told you that my brothers had had followed my dad and left the Amish religion for that little three-day weekend um but they never had peace they couldn't they couldn't eat they couldn't sleep um but then when they found out what he did when my brother told them what what happened and all of that they they came back but when they came back they kind of committed in their heart they're like we're going to be good Amish people like forget everything else we're just going to focus on just being good Amish people because what we believed was wrong so they stick their nose in the bible thinking that's where the Amish religion comes from and as they did I guess they um had an English Bible that they compared the German and the English together and they started realizing what they've been reading and they realized that neither what they were believing or the Amish are right they're they're finding revelation in the word of God and they're like oh my gosh and so they start talking to my husband about it and I'm going you listen to them if you want but I don't want nothing from them not a thing but it was so amazing because what my husband did again, and he's, he's a listener. He's not a talker. He's a listener. And so he's listening to them. And what he did is when they left, he would get out the Bible, the English Bible, and he would see if what they said was true. And he came across Mark seven, where it talks about, you know, the whitewashed tombs where we're just, we're clean on the outside, but we're, yeah on the inside were whitewashed tombs and he realized he would start talking to me he's like babe we're pharisees we're just like the pharisees like we're we're living this life that looks right but we're empty we're not living a christ-like life and so and i had i trusted my husband when he said something i had no problem believing it i fully 100 percent trusted him and so when he started talking to me that they're right, babe, like, look, it's in here. And so I started believing him. And, and then it, from there, it went to listening to some messages from preachers. And obviously all this was Mennonite. Um, and then we had a Mennonite family who actually came and helped us, taught us. And we started going to their Bible studies and we got, you know, the, the gospel message, the salvation message. And then when uh, the Amish church found out that we're going to Bible studies. That's when they gave us an ultimatum. They were like, either you renounce, you reject what you've been learning and you come back or you can't, you, you're going to be excommunicated. Okay. And so can you explain to me, I don't know what a Mennonite is. I I know the name, but I don't know who, what they, what they believe and who they are. So in in a very short answer, very simple terms, they do preach uh, salvation. They do preach that Jesus died for you, um, that you know you need to be born again. Um, but then after that, it's a lot of works to you know now you. So basically, what my experience with it was, um, yeah, they preach Jesus, unconditional love and grace. But then you still have to wear the cape dress. You still have to wear the head covering. You still have to do this. You still have to do that. And um, now the difference between them and the Amish is we weren't excommunicated from them when we left the Mennonites. They were not. They were not a cult. <laughs> um, so, but okay. But what does the now? Could you ask questions in this religion and ask them like, why do you? wear all the garb and but you're teaching freedom you're teaching salvation you're teaching grace what and you usually got an answer from them usually it was uh corinthians you know the chapter is it sec first or second corinthians 11 uh the chapter about the head covering you know where does oh, okay 
here and all that stuff. So whenever we did ask questions in the Mennonites, there definitely was an answer and they were certainly a lot more graceful about, you know, things like that. And so when we left there, there was no shunning. Um, there was no, and actually um, the family that helped us are now also not Mennonite anymore and they are spirit filled and they're, they have a church where I grew up and it's a spirit filled tongue talk in church. So praise the Lord for, yeah. for um, but yeah, so after a while of being in that Mennonite church, I still just felt, uh, like a, the black sheep. Cause all my, all my siblings were having these amazing born again experiences, but here I was not having this born again experience. And, and this is when I became extremely suicidal because I was at the point now that if even this newfound freedom that we have in the gospel that is being preached to us, if that can't help me, then I'm a goner. God just is not going to ever answer my prayer. And so I was like, my only option is, um, is killing myself. And at oh this my point, God. Elizabeth, you've got, you've got three kids now or how many at I this have point? Kids now. What? I have six kids now. So I had those, remember I said I had those first four super okay. close together, and then I had a seven year gap and then we had another one and then we had another six years in between. So the, the baby that you just saw was, yes. it, he's our last one. Um, <laughs> so then you had the four at this point and you still thought there was no way out for you because if God didn't answer. I was in the middle of having four. I was juggling okay. babies. I was pregnant and I was so depressed. I would make food for my family. And I take my plate and I go outside and sit under a tree and eat my food in tears. And I'm just sobbing. And I'm like, this is no life. And so my only way out, I thought, was to kill myself. And uh, so that was the plan. I had it all planned out. I had, I was ready to call my mom, tell her to come over, watch the kids. I'm going to go shopping. And by the time she was supposed to be there, it was going to be all done. I don't know what I thought my kids were going to do. Um but I had everything set up. I had checked the weapon, like everything was ready. And uh, for some reason I had to go to the basement and get something and I'm, I'm kind of holding on to the handrail and I clear as day heard the Lord say, what are you thinking? And it just kind of brought me back to reality. Like, and I remember going, what am I thinking? In long story short, I never made that phone call to my mom. Uh, praise God. And I never went through with it, but I had many after that. I just, you know, it was that tormenting temptation. And it got to where my husband kind of was afraid to go to work because he wasn't sure what he was going to come home to. And so that was kind of, kind of where we were at, um, even after hearing the gospel. And this was right before I started listening to Andrew Womack. Oh, all right. We have to stop. Because I, I thought that might be, it might be a good place to stop because it is have, a really good place to stop. You know, get into the juicy stuff. Andrew Womack has, they have changed millions of people's lives. And, you know, I try to tell them every time I see them, how appreciative we are. Matter of fact, my husband and I just texted him last night because they're celebrating their 55 years of and we tell him all the time, you know, we're just so thankful for him and what he's done for us and so many others. Well, he not only changed my life, his teachings saved my life, quite literally. Like, I don't, I don't think I would be sitting here talking to you for sure. I don't, I, I don't think I'd be sitting anywhere talking to anybody. Why are you making me cry? You keep making me cry. Stop it. I'll send, I'll send you a, I'll send you a, a thing of mascara. <laughs> I need waterproof mascara. Gosh, the story is just too much. And then just to know that, you know, that we know someone like Andrew, that is just, all he did was just st stand or put his, his face in front of a camera or stand up on a stage or whoever's church would have him or his own stage and just told people the truth. And that's what he did. And look what God has done with that. And we're trying to do all these other things. And it's like, we're trying to make it work for us. And it's just, he is such an example to look at. Oh, so. I'm so when I say I'm thankful for Andrew's yes to God, that's an understatement because now I know God could have used anybody, but no, 
Andrew just had such a way where, and, and Joe, my husband's name is Joe, by the way, he just looked up to him so much because, and still does, because he's so calm, he's so, he's not wiping sweat, and he's not screaming, and he's not your cool, like, you know, he's just your ordinary guy, and yeah. I think that's the way my husband is, he's just very down to earth, and so I think he could relate to him, and then he just said the simple truth, whether it hurt or not. And, you know, when we first came to Kara's, I would ask him so many questions. And sometimes his answer just hurt a little bit because it was so blunt. But I also, while it, while it hurt, it also was so refreshing. Like somebody is just giving it to me straight. And it was so refreshing. And it really is that truth that set me free all the counseling all the tears all the write down all the names of the people that have ever hurt you and all of that stuff was just too mushy for me and it just didn't work it was like trying to come from the outside in right. and I didn't, man when when i sat under that fountain of the word it the hurt and the pain and the and the past had nowhere to go except out and I just, I got, anyway, I, I'll save, I'll save it. <laughs> yes, because we got, we've got to go. I'll save it. <laughs> you know, just uh, my, an email that I got, they're celebrating their fifth, their 5,000th teaching on wow. the gospel of truth. Could you imagine he's done 5,000 teachings? My gosh. If you don't see freedom in that, I mean, just listening to something like that, you know, since I think he started in 2000. So it's been 23 years, but man, just that truth, it will set you free. And it's not Andrew's truth. It's the word of God. That is the truth. So we have to let, we have to go, but we will be back next week. Please send this out to everybody that, you know, not just like, well, I don't know anybody that's caught up in a culture. I don't know anybody that's on, it doesn't matter. You just send this out to anybody, you know, because Elizabeth has shared her, like her deepest part of her heart. And whether it's because you've come from a cult or you've been lied to by your parents or whatever it is, all those years, it doesn't matter. Look what happened, how the truth has set her free. So we're going to learn more about that in the next episode. So follow us to the next one. So we thank you all so much for listening, for watching. You know, that's what we're doing here at Healing Journeys today with all of our teachers is that we're just teaching truth every day. And it is the truth that sets you free. And I love the scripture that says that I find no greater joy than for my children to walk in truth. And that is where the freedom is. So we'll see you guys next week. And Elizabeth, thank you so much. And we'll, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. 